Getting your filmmaking questions answered, especially early on in your career, can be really difficult. I didn't go to film school, and so I remember when I was just starting out, I had so many questions I couldn't find the answers to anywhere. I remember spending hours and hours on Google trying to figure out how to solve my problems, and more often than not, I just couldn't. And even though I do my best to solve as many problems for you as possible in these videos, since I can only put out one a week, it's pretty much impossible to answer them all. So I asked you guys what you were struggling with the most, and in this video, I'm gonna try and answer as many of them as I can, and hopefully make your lives as filmmakers just a little bit easier. And just in case your first question is, where are you right now? I'm still up here in the Canadian Arctic on the side of a tributary of the Mackenzie River, and I'm here for at least another six weeks. And no, I haven't changed my clothes since the last video, though you may be happy to know that I'm at least keeping my socks and underwear fresh. That's disgusting. It's also really cold out here, so just so I don't freeze to death, I'm gonna take you guys for a bit of a walk while I answer the first few questions. Okay, so the first round of questions here is gonna come from members of the community group for people who enrolled in the documentary cinematography course. Then I'm gonna move on to the broader YouTube community. The course filled up in like four days or something like that. So it's still closed for now because I wanted to keep the size intentionally small so I can actually interact with people. Uh, so if you wanna get your questions answered a little bit faster, you might wanna get your name on that wait list. There's a link in the description and I'll open it up sometime in January or around there anyways. I'm gonna start off here with one from Thomas who is actually a runner up for my mentorship program program last year and from what I can see has been working super hard ever since. Thomas asks, how do you shoot on other people's films when you're used to the freedom of working on your own projects? Like, how do you ignore your own ideas and focus on someone else's vision instead? It's a great question and something that most filmmakers will have to deal with because the reality is the majority of us won't be able to support ourselves doing only what we want. Almost all of us are gonna need day jobs, which means taking assignments for other people and shooting in a way that may or may not be in line with our creative instincts. And Thomas, for me, it comes down to recognizing that reality of life as a filmmaker is not always perfect, and that some days you're just at work. Like if you had a normal nine to five job doing data entry or something, you'd have to do things that someone else tells you to do that might not necessarily line up with what you choose to do with your time. I happen to think that filmmaking is a lot more fun than most jobs out there, but that doesn't mean it's not a job at times. I definitely struggled with this at different points in my career when I disagree with the direction that a director was taking or when a project was released and it was way different, i.e. worse than I thought it would be. But at the end of the day, we all need to make money. And for filmmakers, that normally means taking jobs on other people's shoots. And in those situations, I just tell myself, today I'm at work and I take a deep breath and focus on being the best asset to the team that I can. You can almost make it a game. How easy can I be to work with today? Or how much can I support the director's vision? Or how can I leave here making the best possible impression on the crew? Then you take that money and use it to make a film in exactly the way you want. Okay, let me find a place to get out of the wind for a second and I'll move on to the next one. Next up is from Ryan Holland who asks, when do you censor things in your film? I.e., when is it morally incorrect to show certain things? This is a great question and something we all have to find our own position on. Basically, my take is that we should always tell the truth, but when possible, err on the side of kindness. Like, for example, I was shooting a feature film last summer and some of the characters I was following would party really hard on their nights off and sometimes do things that were, let's just say, not legal. That was all part of their experience and they were open enough to show it to me honestly, but in the end, I made the conscious decision not to film anything that would negatively impact the rest of their lives. Like, I don't know where that film will end up, and even though it might have been dramatic TV to show someone doing drugs, most of them were just young adults having fun, and if I'd shown them doing certain things, I easily could have done lasting damage to their lives. Like, what if someone wanted to go out and be a teacher, but because they let me into their story and I put them on Netflix or something doing illegal things, they weren't able to get a job. For me, that just didn't add enough to the story to justify the harm I could do. Like it was still very possible to show the essence of the party lifestyle without physically showing them ingesting drugs. And so I made the decision not to show any of that stuff. But everyone will have to make their own decisions when it comes to things like this. And there's also gonna be times when it's absolutely justified to show the ugly truth, even if it hurts someone. Only you can make the decision when that is, but if you just remember to be honest but strive for kindness when possible, I think you'll get it right most of the time. Okay, next up, Akeem asks, asks, how important is the editing process and should we edit raw footage every day after shooting? Well, right off the bat, I'd say that editing is where the story really takes place in doc and that it's incredibly
incredibly important for the final product. In narrative films, editing is also super important, obviously, but for the most part, the story has been decided in advance, right down to the storyboards. In docs, we might have a rough idea or even a good idea of where the story is going, but we end up shooting a lot more, sometimes hitting shooting ratios of like 100 or 1 to more, meaning that for every minute of footage used, we shoot 100 total minutes. And that number can go way up. Like I shot over 400 hours last summer for a 90 minute doc, so finding the real story inside all of that is going to happen in post. With that said, I usually still try to know the general spine of my story before I start, so it's not just about spraying and praying and then figuring it out later. But you will inevitably end up shooting way more than you need and finding unexpected gold in there, so in short, the edit is massive in docs. When it comes to editing footage every day, that sounds great in theory, but in reality, I'm almost always way too tired to do that well. It usually makes a lot more sense to set up a really good backup work workflow, but I don't bother actually editing anything until I'm done with the shoot. For me, it's much better to save my mental and physical energy to focus on the shoot days and then set aside days after the fact to comb through it all. Next up, Fernando asks, what does good pre-production look like on a big feature? Now this one's a bit tough to answer because it's always a little different, but most good pre-pro involves knowing a few key things before you start shooting. That means the director should have a clear vision about the story they're setting out to tell. So by that I mean they're is a story, not just a topic. And they should also know who the main characters are and what they're trying to achieve. Big productions have too many crew members and every day in the field is too expensive to just go out there and shoot aimlessly. That doesn't mean that you need to know exactly what's gonna happen or that there's no room to explore new ideas or characters as they come up, but you wanna be shooting to a solid plan and then allow it to change, not arrive with a full crew and hope to find something there. For the director and producer, pre-pro means working together to define the story, establish the characters, and then work out the logistics for how it's going to happen. That means a ton of back and forth and lots of conversations. When things are a little more clearly defined, then it's time to bring in a DP and start talking about the visual themes and style. There's no real rules about when this should happen or how many meetings need to take place, but the bigger the cost and the higher the pressure, the more meetings and talking ahead of time, the smoother things are going to run in the field. But even at a much smaller scale, most successful docs spend more time on pre-pro than you might think, and it's usually never a good idea to just show up and start rolling. Okay, it looks like there's some rain clouds rolling in, so I'm gonna move one more time and see if I can't find a little bit of cover to finish this off. Okay, the next question is from Saul Morales, who asks, what's the best approach to convince someone who doesn't want to be a character in your documentary? Well, unfortunately for me, the answer is to move on. I almost never try and convince anyone who's opposed to being in the doc because the reality is that you will need so much vulnerability and cooperation from them in order to tell a good story that they're usually gonna get irritated and walk away. It can be tempting to see the perfect character on paper and think, if only I can get them to change their mind, I'm gonna have an amazing story. But making a doc requires so much collaboration with your characters that you really need them to be invested in taking part. This is different if you're doing something like Michael Moore, where he is often in an adversarial relationship with the subjects. But if you want your characters to willingly take part, my best advice is to work with people who want to let you in without needing to be convinced. You're gonna to wanna to film with people in the most intimate and difficult moments of their lives. And people who are convinced against their will are normally the ones who will shut down and lock you out in exactly the moments when you need them to work with you the most. I know that's frustrating to hear, but it's rare to have a successful collaboration with someone who doesn't wanna participate. So I'd say you should probably just move on most of the time, as much as that hurts. All right, hold on. My shoulder's killing me. I have no idea how vloggers do this, but I guess they probably don't hold fully built out FX3 rigs. But I think I see a little clearing up ahead. Just give me one second. Okay, so that clearing was a bust, uh, but I think the rain's gonna hold off. It's just a light drizzle and I found this cool log, so just thought I'd finish it up here. I mean, look how cool this is. This is one of the best things about this job is you get to come out here and be exposed to environments like this that I have no business being in and probably will never get to come back to. So still love this job, even after all these years, in case you were wondering. This next question is from Matt, who wants to know how to start laying out an edit. Should you start with a roll and then layering on from there is the basics of his question. This is a good one because if you've ever been faced with a blank timeline and a ton of footage, you'll know it can lead to deep despair. For me, 
it really depends on what kind of dock I'm making and how long it is, but the very first thing I do is make dailies or string outs or whatever you wanna call them. If you don't know what that is, I made a video not long ago that you can check out, I'll link to it in the description, but basically it's a bunch of timelines of five second clips of everything you've shot so that you can scan through it all very quickly while also getting to know your footage in the process. Once I have those made, then I'll try and start editing in terms of scenes rather than in one unbroken timeline. I'll start a new timeline for the opening and then a new one for each individual scene in the film and then string them all together in the end to make one cohesive edit. Starting with the A-roll is a good idea, generally speaking, and it's a great place to start, but in the long term, you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about telling your story through a series of scenes, ideally not just alternating between interview and B-roll. Now that said, creating an A-roll spine is a great idea because it will show the core of your story. So all of that is a long-winded way to say, yes, start with your A-roll, but down the road, if at all possible, we wanna show and not tell our story, and that means following our characters as they experience life, rather than hearing them explain it through an interview. Interviews are still valuable and pure verite filmmaking is really hard, so don't stress if you're not doing this exactly right now, but it's a good long-term goal. I use interviews all the time in my projects, but I do try to use them as little as possible to varying degrees of success. Okay, next is a question from Wildlife Louie, which I really hope is your legal name, uh, who's asking for tips on how to go full-time from production company to freelancing. Well, Wildlife, or perhaps you prefer Mr. Louie, my first tip to you would be to save as much cash as you possibly can. Freelancing is incredibly up and down, and if you're used to a regular paycheck, it can be really easy to panic when the money stops coming in for a few months, like it definitely will. I generally like to stash away at least six months of operating cash, and the more you're able to weather a storm, like a pandemic, for example, the longer you'll be able to stay in the game. The next thing I'd say about freelancing is it's all about networking. If people don't know who you are, the job offers just aren't gonna come in. That means plastering your name all over town, because for the most part, people aren't gonna find you through a website anymore. Now, obviously there is a chance, but there is usually so much competition for Google searches for like New York videographer or London documentary filmmaker or whatever, that you can't rely on people finding you that way. To really thrive as a freelancer, you want word of mouth to work for you more than anything. And the best way to get that going is to meet with as many people as possible and keep your name at the top of their mind. That means sending as many emails, booking as many meetings and going to as many networking events as you can manage. And the more the better here. Lastly, I'd say you'll wanna make sure that you have at least three spec projects to show that are in line with the style of work you're hoping to get hired for. Now, I'm not sure what you're doing right now, but if your full-time job was say making corporate videos and now you're hoping to get hired as a DP on Verite style docs, it's gonna be hard to land those first jobs. You need to be able to show that you can do the work you're trying to get. So if you don't already have good work samples, shoot some spec projects before you quit. If you start your freelance career with a solid portfolio and the kit you need to actually execute those types of projects, you're gonna be in a much better spot than with a resume of unrelated work. Okay, so we're starting to run a little bit long here, I think, and it is getting cold and it is starting to rain a little bit harder. So I'm gonna do one last question and call it because I can feel my hands starting to lock up and I don't wanna soak my camera. This one is a great question from Jim who asks, how do you know when your doc is done? My director locked up the last shoot, but I felt like I could have kept on going forever. I think we all struggle with this, but it often comes down to remembering the three Fs of filmmaking, filmmakers finish films. A three quarter or even 95% completed film is essentially the same as no film at all. And the most important part other than starting is to actually get the thing done and out in the world. That means making a hard choice sometimes and just calling it a day for the sake of making progress. There's no rule here to follow, unfortunately, but if you have the scenes or beats you need to show your character changing over time and moving towards accomplishing their goal, then you might have what you need to tell your story. If you wanna keep shooting, then the question to ask is, is what we're waiting for going to show some aspect of their story that we haven't already seen? Or is this gonna change the way the audience sees their journey or make it more powerful than what we already have? If the answer is yes, then it might be worth waiting. If the answer is no, and the future material is just gonna kind of stay the same thing, but in a slightly different way or in a different setting, then it might be time to call it quits. Now you wanna make sure in docs that you don't repeat yourself. And saying the same thing twice is a really good way to make your audience bored in a hurry. So if you're just hanging around to get more of the same, it could be that you're actually just stalling because continuing to film is often easier than wrapping and moving on to the edit in a lot of ways. Now I'm not saying you're doing this right now, but I've done it in the past before because
because as long as you're still in that shooting phase, then you don't have to deal with all the hard work that's coming. All right, speaking of knowing when to wrap, let's end this one here. That was really fun for me and I hope it helped answer some of your questions because I know it can be hard to find answers out there sometimes. I do wish I could answer every question that comes my way every day, but with the increasing load of comments and the dozens of emails I get every week, it's kind of getting impossible to give the personalized feedback I'd like to. It's a bit more doable in the members group for people who signed up for the course, so if you want to get your questions answered a bit faster, you might want to get on the waiting list for the next intake, which is January or sometime. But in the meantime, I hope you learned something new and maybe got a few ideas for your own filmmaking journey. See ya.